So hi, everybody. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, so uh, e even with that lovely introduction about squeeze light and optical cooling, today I'm going to tell you about something that's even cooler. And that's uh, the detection uh, of gravitational waves. Now, I want to start off by just having you pay a little attention to this title slide because there's a lot of important information uh, in there. So the first thing that I want you to notice is the number 100 years. So we're exploring the warped universe. So we're going to go on a journey today that takes us to those parts of the universe that are inherently dark. We can't see light from them and also very warped and actually quite violent. So if you're a little queasy with those things, you might want to leave. All right. Now, uh, the other thing I want you to notice is it's a 100-year journey, so that's going to be a little bit of a journey with, uh, to do that. All of the things I'm going to talk to you about, which was the detection of gravitational waves with these detectors that we call LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, was done in a big collaboration. So I'm just the messenger. This was the LIGO and Virgo collaborations of uh, many hundred scientists. And finally, I also want to point out that a small little round logo on, uh, on, on, on the bottom right is the National Science Foundation. They funded this whole thing over many decades. So this is also a story in public funding. But now let me go, step back to the fun part. And that is to tell you that on the front pages of virtually every newspaper in any language that you, would, you choose in any country, the headlines on February 12, 2016 was about the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And so today what I want to do is I want to take those headline stories and unpack them a little. What was the story behind the headlines and what did we really do? Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is step back a little bit and ask how do we know about most of the things in the universe? When we look out into the sky, what do we see? Well, it started with the ancients. We looked at things with our naked eyes. And then we got better at building instruments. And eventually, we got so good at that that we could look at some of the most spectacular uh, objects in the universe. And here is an example. This is a supernova remnant. And this is one of my most favorite pictures in astronomy, maybe my second most favorite after the detection of gravitational waves now. <laughs> but what this picture shows is it's actually a composite made up of three different wavelengths of light. This is an object called Cassiopeia A. It is what's left over after, uh, several hundred years after a star died. So a star very much like our own sun exploded. And why did it explode? Because it ran out of nuclear fuel, and so it kind of got crunched under its own self-gravity. And as this process happened, it threw off a bit of material, and that's all the gas and dust you see in different colors. And those different colors are different wavelengths of light. The reddish colors are infrared light, so that's the color of light that our own eyes can't see. Snake eyes can, but ours can't. Then the green yellows are optical, which is what our eyes uh, see. And then the blue colors are actually x-ray, so very energetic photons. And what you see is that as these ejecta of gas and dust were blown off by the star, the blues went out the farthest because they're the most energetic. Okay? Now, if you pay very close attention, at the very center of this object, you'll see a small blue dot. Does everybody see it? Yes. What is that? It's blue because it only shows up when you look at this object with an X-ray telescope, at Cassiopeia A. It is a new star, a kind of star called a neutron star, and it is the star that's born when this parent star that was like our own sun died. And this neutron star is kind of remarkable. It has about the mass of our sun, but it has a radius that's 10 kilometers. So it's actually about the size of, of the width of Manhattan. Okay, so imagine that. Our own sun, its radius, 700,000 kilometers. This object, same mass, 10 kilometers. So it has a lot of gravity in it. And that's my point. When stars like our own sun die, they produce these very dense, compact stars called neutron stars. Now, if this parent star that exploded had been heavier, if it had been three to 10 times the mass of our sun, then instead of a, a neutron star, its gravity would have been so much larger that it would have kept shrinking until it became a black hole. And that's how black holes are born. They're actually born out of stars like our own. Star dies. If it's light, it forms a neutron star. If it's a bit heavier, it forms a cousin, which is a black hole. And so that's the process that we see when we look out in the sky with different colors of light. Now, this black hole 
this is actually not a real picture. The first one's a real picture taken with telescopes. This one is actually an artist's rendition of a black hole. And in this picture, what you see is all this swirl of gas and dust as it's orbiting the black hole. And of course, the stuff that gets too close to the black hole will get sucked in, but there's a whole bunch of stuff around the black hole that's just being swirled around as the black hole spins. And this is the way that we collect evidence for black holes until recently. We look out into the sky, we look for objects like this where the gas and dust around the black hole starts glowing, and usually in the X-ray. You can even see this gas and dust flickering, and the frequency at which it flickers tells you the frequency at which the black hole is spinning around its axis. So that's another thing we learn about black holes. They can spin. But until recently, we have not, not been able to answer the question of, what do black holes really look like? How might we observe them? Because intrinsically, unless they're surrounded by gas and dust, which some are, they're invisible to light. Light doesn't escape a black hole. That's its definition. It's a star that's so, that has so much gravity packed into such a small volume that even light can't escape, right? So this brings me to a new type of messenger, a gravitational wave. And that's gravity's messenger. So if we want to understand what a gravitational wave is, we should really think about what gravity is. And the first person who really gave serious thought to gravity and formed a very uh, fine theory of it was Isaac Newton. And so in the 17th century, Isaac Newton had this fantastically successful universal law of gravitation. It was called universal because it could explain why apples fell from trees, but it could also explain why moons orbited planets and perhaps, and eventually why the planets orbit the sun. And it's actually quite simple. If you look at the equation that Newton coined, it, it says there's a force. If you have two masses, and they have a mass m1 and m2, so two masses, and they're separated by some distance r, then they feel a gravitational force mutually, and that force is proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. We all learned this in our early, early physics classes, and it's a beautiful theory. Now, Newton himself worried about something. He worried about this idea of action at a distance. What's that? Well, how can this mass here and this mass there know about each other? What is the, 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 the way that information is ex exchanged between them? And that never got solved in, in Newton's time, and in fact, didn't get solved until uh, several hundred years later, 300 years later, uh, uh, more or less, and that was with the work of our next great hero of gravity, and that's Albert Einstein. Now, Einstein was pretty radical when it came to gravity. He, he kind of told us to throw out the idea of force. Gravity is not a force, Einstein said to us. Gravity is geometry. What does that mean? Well, so I, uh, Einstein's version of gravity is that when you have some massive object sitting out in empty space, that massive object will warp that region of empty space, very much like if you put a bowling ball in the center of a cushion. The bowling ball will curve the, the, the cushion, and if you put a playing marble at the edge of the cushion, the marble must fall into the bowling ball. That was the way he described gravity, its curvature of space-time. And in fact, he actually also was also able to codify it in a, in a very beautiful uh, equation, and that's this equation that relates on the one side how, how um, uh, energy is, is contained in a system, and on the other side, how uh, geometry is contained in the system. So this equation, it looks really lovely and sweet, but it is actually really a horrendously difficult equation to solve. And in fact, it has taken almost a century to get even the first sort of handles on exact solutions of this equation uh, in the case of black holes. So that's Einstein's idea of gravity. Now Einstein added one more piece to, to, to this in his general theory of relativity. He asked the question of what happens if the, ma if the massive object isn't just sitting around, just sitting still? What if it's accelerating? What, what if it's oscillating or vibrating? What happens then? Well, then his picture was that space-time must ripple. Very much like if you threw a rock in the middle of a quiet pond, ripples spread out from the rock. Same thing happens if you take a, a massive object and you, uh, you accelerate it or bob it around. And that's what this next video shows. Space-time is this flat grid. If the star is oscillating up and down, you will see that this flat grid of space-time is actually forms ripples, and these ripples spread out and travel away from the source, just like the ripples on the surface of a pond would travel away after you drop the rock. 
And that was Einstein's picture of gravitational waves. These are ripples of the space-time itself. This is, of course, a very simplified picture because it's, it's a two-dimensional representation of a theory in, uh, in, for, for, uh, which is actually four-dimensional because there's three dimensions of space and also a dimension of time. But this is a nice picture to carry. If you're wondering what a gravitational wave is, it's really just a ripple of space-time, and it behaves very much like you would think of other waves. They actually take carry away energy, and they have frequencies associated with them, or wavelengths, and all of those things, okay? All right, so if you wanted to do astrophysics with this gra these messengers of gravity, what must you know? You must know a few things about the properties of these, these lights, uh, of, these, of these waves, rather. So ordinarily, when we look out into the universe, we use light. That's what, we, uh, that, that's what I started my talk with, that beautiful uh, picture of uh, Cassiopeia, eh? And light is created when you accelerate charge. So if you just took an electron out of your pocket and you put it on a spring and you accelerate it, it will radiate electromagnetic waves, which is light. Now, very much in the same way, but in, a, in a loose analogy, gravitational waves are radiated when you accelerate mass. Okay, so that's the first thing you wanna know. Now, it turns out that char uh, charges are pretty light. And as a result, you can accelerate them to very, very high uh, frequencies. And as a result, you can have objects that have, you know, that wig cause light waves with, uh, with very short wavelengths. And that allows us to form images or pretty pictures. So whenever you look out into the sky with light, the very first thing you do is you see some beautiful picture of an object. And then you dig deeper and you understand the, the, the physical processes going on. Now it turns out with gravitational waves, if you're trying to oscillate a, 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 something that has the mass of a, of a sun or, or, or bigger, it doesn't want to wig, uh, oscillate very fast. So gravitational waves are intrinsically low frequency uh, waves, and in fact, their wavelengths are, 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 are very long. It can be, you know, uh, kilometers to hundreds of kilometers. And as a result, you don't really form these pretty images, but in fact, you form waveforms. And what are waveforms? Waveforms are a way of, of mapping the bumps and wiggles of the space-time itself as a function of frequency. And that's what that picture in the box shows. We call the amplitude of the gravitational wave a strain, and we'll come to why that's useful, as a function of time. And in fact, because some of the objects that we are looking for with our detectors here on the Earth oscillate at the frequencies that uh, belong in the human audio band, we encode them sometimes even into pretty sound. So instead of pretty, you can think about it this way. With light telescopes, you make pretty pictures. With gravitational wave detectors, you can make pretty sounds. Now, there's a couple of things, if you're an astronomer, that are very important about gravitational waves versus light. Light, it turns out, is an extremely friendly creature. Every time a photon meets matter, it interacts with it. It gets absorbed, it gets scattered, it gets dispersed by matter. Gravitational waves, on the other, other hand, are extremely aloof. They, simply, they interact extremely weakly with matter. And as a result, if you're, a, if you're an astronomer, and you point your telescope at an object and you see the light from it, you have to work pretty hard to decide if the light has somehow been changed along the way because it met some other object as it was traveling from its original source. Gravitational waves, you don't have to worry about that at all. They pass through everything more or less unchanged, so you don't have to worry about what's between you and, and, and the source. Um, and the, the way to think about this, as a nice analogy if you want to carry it away, if you are light, you're like, it's like going to a party with an extrovert, and you're ready to go home. And you say, all right, let's go. And then your extrovert friend meets someone, chats a bit, meets someone else, chats a bit. It takes you an hour to get out of the party, and by the time you get out of the party, you might not even get out the front door. You might go through a side door or something else. Gravitational waves are exactly the opposite. They're like going to the same party with an introvert. You say, I'm ready to leave, and if you're lucky, they'll say goodbye and thank you to the host, and you're out the front door. Very little interaction. So that's the, the, the power of these, these, one of the powerful things about these objects is that they're, they're actually carry information without uh, much change from when they were generated at the source. Now, just as, as, uh, as a reminder, light waves, because the oscillations are pretty fast, those are happening at 100 megahertz or faster, so you know, and gravitational waves, because the oscillations can't be very fast, they're usually about 10 kilohertz or slower.